So welcome everyone. It is so great to see a crowd. Um, it's kind of a thrill because I had no idea who might show up and it's maybe not the best time for everyone because it's dinner time. But anyway, I'm glad you made the time and welcome to Harmony Animal Hospital's first training webinar. Um, I'm Karen. I have been training dogs since 2011 and I've had my own business called Eager Beagle since about 2017. Um, I am also joined tonight by Nicole, Nicole Negley, who is a veterinary assistant at Harmony. And she is going to be the star of several demonstration videos with her professional um, actor, Dog Moose. So, and I believe Alex Lee, who's um, Aunt Harmony's uh, communications manager is also with us. So if you guys wanna unmute yourselves and say hello, that would be great. Hello everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hi, I think it's working for me as well. Oh, great, great, I'm glad. So, <clears throat> Nicole is really the pro when it comes to cooperative care, which you'll see in a moment. Um, but I'm just going to give you some background and some explanations of some of the principles we're going to be talking about. Maybe look like some sort of bacteria. And then um, <laughs> I also have a couple of videos of my dog, which will amuse you, I think. Um, so let's get started. Is this your dog at the vet. This dog says, I was fine till I got here. Um, I think that's a, the way a lot of our dogs feel. And I'm guessing since you decided to tune in tonight to this webinar, your dog might have a similar attitude uh, about going to the vet. So, but the thing is you've already done something that is super important to help them. You have decided to take them to Harmony. Uh, Harmony Animal Hospital is one of only two fear-free certified vet practices within 100 miles of Alexandria. This means that the entire staff of the clinic is um, has gone through a rigorous training program and testing to learn how to reduce fear, anxiety, and stress in their patients. And their patients are your dogs. Um, the number of certified fear-free veterinary professionals is growing steadily, but getting an entire vet clinic certified is a big commitment and it's still far less common. So like I said, there are only a, a couple, there are only two within a hundred miles and we're lucky to have one for me. It's, you know, kind of almost just down the road. So let's talk a little bit first about what is Fear free. It is um, a program that was developed a, a number of years ago by now, I forget, maybe 2016. And the whole kind of game of it is um, I have this cute tagline that says, taking the pet out of petrified. So it means everything is done with the intent to minimize the amount of fear, anxiety, and stress that your dog feels when they go to the vet for routine checkups and for any other procedures or tests they might need. And these are some of the fear-free features. Some of them you might have noticed, some of them you might not have. Um, and they sort of, some of them sort of fly under the radar until they're pointed out. Um, but like I said, everything is done to reduce fear, anxiety, and stress. There are calming pheromones wafting about all over the place in the lobby, um, in all of the exam rooms. There, there's a diffuser, this thing uh, plugged into the wall, you know, all over the all over the hospital. What this is, is it's called adaptal, and it's actually a synthetic form of a pheromone, which is a chemical signal that a mother dog emits to her puppies when she's nursing to make them feel safe and content and also so they don't fight over nipples. <laughs> so scientists figured out the recipe for this stuff and they put it in a bottle and research shows that it really does work to help dogs feel calm. 
Um, vets will spray it on themselves. And they're, like I said, there's diffusers all over the vet hospital. You can buy this um, online on Chewy or Amazon, or you can find it in a pet store. Um, you can spray it in the car if your dog's nervous. You can, there's also a kind of a cat um, analog called Feel Away. And it ha also has a calming effect on cats. And I use it with my cats and my three cats just cluster around the cat trees, right around the outlet where the thing is plugged in, something they never used to do before the feel away was plugged in. So the stuff works. Um, you probably know that at Harmony, your, your dog will be treated to any number of high value treats from whipped cream to baby food and everything in between. Um, vets, you, the vets and the veterinary care team use gentle handling techniques. They even sit on the floor with your dog instead of hoisting them up onto one of those cold, tall, shiny metal tables. Um, the, oops, the vets and their, the vet techs and the whole care team uh, understand canine body language and stress signals. And that's important because they know when an animal needs a break. They know when a dog is too afraid to proceed. They know when the dog has kind of collected themselves and shaken it off. And most procedures are done in the exam room with you present. And if you choose to, with you helping out. Um, and uh, also another feature that I love is the couches and, the, and there are non-slip floors. Going into exam room, an exam room is almost like, you know, going into someone's living room. So it's all set up to make things feel just less threatening and more, um, more comfortable. So this is just a silly comic I found while I was um, putting this presentation together. And it just, it's a dog, you know, talking to the vet and saying, no offense, but I really prefer to be seen by a dog. I'm sure you understand. And, you know, as a woman who kind of for whatever reason, prefers to see female doctors. I, I just sort of, this resonated with me. And, you know, it may be that this is, <laughs> maybe this is what our dogs are thinking when they go to the vet. They feel like, uh, you know, they want to be seen at least by someone who gets them. And a fear-free vet who follows cooperative care principles is really the next best thing. So what are we talking about when we're talking about cooperative care? What is this term? What does it mean? It's one of the cornerstones of the fear-free model. And it means that the animal, the dog in our case, but a tiger in this case, is going to participate in its own care. And it's going to accept vet handling because it's been trained ahead of time. So it knows what to expect. And it's learned that it's, um, that, you know, to, not to be afraid and not to resist. And um, it means that the vet and the vet team are going to read the dog's stress signals and procedures are gonna be paused if they see that the animal needs a break. So here is a video from the Copenhagen Zoo. Uh, nobody's speaking Danish. It's all, I think it's pretty wordless. It's just watch the tiger and what the tiger does and watch the zookeeper and what he does. So the zookeeper has taught the tiger um, to offer various body parts for um, examination and for procedures like injections, blood draws, and so on. So you'll see the tiger offer its paw, offer its belly, and offer its tail um, during this short So, and this is, you know, keep in mind, this is just practice. Um, and this is done routinely. And when it's the real thing, when they really, when vets really need to give an injection or take blood or check out, you know, a body part and see what's going on, the tiger knows what to expect and is, is, uh, tolerant. So take a look. <laughs> So you see he's using a target stick, this orange thing, and the tiger knows to touch his paw to the target stick. Then the, the um, 
trainer is is clicking, which is marking the behavior that he, that the tiger is going to get rewarded for, and telling him that this raw meat is coming. Now he's pinching. This is simulating an injection. So just a word about the clicker. When you are working with your dog at home, you don't need a clicker. We're not, um, the reason that this guy's using a clicker is to signify the end of the procedure um, period of time. So he wants the tiger to hold his paw in place for a certain amount of time. And that's why he's clicking at the end to let the tiger know, now you have earned your reward. But when you're working with your dog, you're just going to be feeding, touching and feeding and touching and feeding. They don't have to accomplish anything. They don't have to master any particular skill. They're just going to feel good while you're poking at them. And what's going on there is if the tiger's standing up, that means his entire abdomen is visible um, and can be visually examined or um, palpated if necessary. He's been taught to open his mouth with a hand signal like this so that the teeth can be checked and the rest of the mouth. This is my favorite part. Watch the tiger offer his tail to be pulled through this little hole. This is for a blood draw. He's not going to draw the blood, but he's going to pretend. He's going to do everything that would be involved except for the most of All right, that's enough of that. It goes on, but <laughs> we have other things to get to. Okay. So that's pretty amazing, right? That's a tiger. That's a that's a ferocious wild animal, not really, but that's a animal that doesn't have to cooperate, right? But the the tiger is cooperating because the trainer has made it really worthwhile and turned the whole thing into a game that's fun to play. And then the prize is all that raw meat. And this is how, um, this is how they do it at the zoo. And this is how you can do it too. So cooperative care has a role for everyone. And your role is to help your vet help your pet by doing this stuff at home in the comfort of your own living room or kitchen or backyard or wherever your dog is happy and just getting them used to all these weird procedures that they're going to have to submit to when they go to the vet. They're not weird. To, they're not weird to us. They're just weird for our dogs. So you're going to pretend you're the vet. You're going to practice make-believe blood draws and vaccinations. And you're going to do that in the same way the um, zookeeper did with the tigers. Just poke and pinch, but not really, you know, you're not really going to do the real procedures, but you're just going to get your dog in the habit of expecting that kind of handling and expecting those kinds of sensations. So they'll know what to expect so that their next vet appointment will be less scary. This is an example of um, cooperative care that's, this one is a little more sophisticated than anything that we're going to ask you to do at home. Um, notice this dog is wearing a beautiful muzzle that is in fashion colors. And this is just, you know, a, a nice precaution just for safety for everyone involved. And what you'll see is this dog is doing the same kind of thing the tiger was, just kind of 
standing still and accepting this kind of mock um, injection. So let's take a look. Squeeze, poke, and then she gives a treat. What she's doing there, we're not going to ask you to do this, but it is something that's become kind of a, it's kind of a trend in a lot of, um, with a lot of trainers and, and, uh, uh, and uh, for vet procedures, the dog has been trained to put his nose on the owner's uh, palm when he's ready to uh, resume the procedure. So you saw the the vet or the vet tech start to reach for the, for the kind of, it's not a scruff. What is it like between the shoulder blades to pinch the skin? And then they remembered, oh, I need to wait until the dog says I'm ready. And so they withdrew their hand and the owner is waiting for the dog to signal that he's ready to continue. So it's just pit ready. She's doing the begging already. And notice the tail is wagging. It's a nice low wag. Good boy. Now she's squeezing. Pinch. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh boy. Cool. Oh, here gets yeah, right, right. the treat. Bag. Ready. Pinch. Yes. What a yeah. good boy. I'm I see. Oh, you <laughs> Ah, uh, I love it. So you want to make it fun, right? It doesn't have to be scary if your dog becomes accustomed to it. So you're going to make it fun and you're going to make it tasty. So these are, <laughs> this is sampling of things that your dog might like to um, to uh, nosh on while you're practicing these veterinary procedures at home. You want to use your dog's favorite treats when you're practicing cooperative care at home and also when you're at the vet because you're trying to create a positive association with being handled for examinations and blood draws and vaccinations. And milk bones and Charlie bears are not going to cut it. So don't try to slip those past your dog. That's just, don't be stingy. <laughs> Charlie bears, I hate Charlie bears. They're like oyster crackers for dogs. No offense to the Charlie bear manufacturers, but you know that your dog, given the choice, would rather eat spam than oyster crackers. Um, I worked, I've worked in a, an animal shelter as a behavior specialist for uh, several years. And we use this with new um, dogs who come in, uh, you know, in, during intake, we use liverwurst, we use easy cheese, we use all kinds of things to just get them through that initial um, exam because they're scared, they don't know what just happened to them, and um, it makes the process really quick and simple. So figure out what your dog's favorites are. Maybe it's bacon, maybe it's cat food, maybe it's baby food, maybe it's cream cheese. I've even seen at Harmony, they use whipped cream. They use all kinds of things that you never thought a dog could eat, but they can. They just shouldn't have a steady diet of, you know, all of these saturated fats and sodium and such, but they can have it as a treat. These things are, you're going to figure out which ones your dog loves best, and you're only going to feed them these treats when you're practicing cooperative care. So that makes the cooperative care practice like a special treat special occasion. Um, so you're going to break out the people food and really indulge your dog with something that they can't resist. So, and while you're practicing with your dog, you want to look out for these little signs of stress. I think we all can tell when our dogs are afraid, you know, we expect the tucked tail and the cowering and but dogs show us signs of stress in much more subtle ways and ways that might surprise us because there, there's no there's no kind of human analog. When I yawn, it's because I'm tired or it's because somebody else yawned and I'm very contagious. Um, when a dog yawns, they're telling you something is making them uncomfortable or something just made them uncomfortable. Dogs don't really yawn when they're tired, not so much. 
So if you see a yawn out of context, it's telling you your dog's uncomfortable and it behooves you to figure out why and make, make it stop. Um, lip licks. This is a one favorite way to um, take pictures of dogs. We love when a dog is licking its lips, but most of the time, unless your dog has just eaten something like we had on the last slide, a lip lick or a tongue flick out of context is a sign of stress. Something called whale eye or half moon eye. You see here the whites of this little dog's eyes, and it's because of the facial tension. Um, all the muscles in the forehead are pulled back. And so it's, it's um, exposing that part of the eye that's not usually visible if the face is relaxed. A clamped jaw, especially if your dog has had their mouth open and then suddenly clamps it shut. That's another signal of stress. And ears pinned back like this, or sometimes out to the side, we call it airplane ears, another sign. And shaking off when they're not wet, that's kind of just a release of stress that tells you your dog was stressed and is now kind of just having a reset. So here's the fabulous Nicole and her fabulous dog, Moose. Um, Nicole is part of the Harmony Veterinary Care Team and her wonder dog, Moose, knows all the things. So they're going to show you how to help your dog feel okay about um, all the kind of poking and prodding and restraint and kind of squeezing and manipulating that is involved in um, drawing blood. And this is something that doesn't have to be painful for your dog. I mean, you know yourself, if you're a person who doesn't really mind giving blood or doesn't really mind, you know, the, the just routine procedures, you know that it hurts less or not at all if you're calm, but it's going to hurt a lot more if you're scared. So um, Nicole and Moose are going to show you what happens when you get your dog used to all these, this charade of drawing blood through these make-believe pokes and pinches. And once they're used to it, the whole procedure when you're in the vet office is going to go so much more smoothly and quickly, and it'll be so much less stressful for your dog. So let's take a look. All right. We are going to show you the three most common ways to hold off for your dog for blood draw. And so with you teaching your dog to be comfortable with it, they will be more comfortable with it at the vet. And so that way the blood draw is an easy peasy appointment to do and not a hassle and non-stressful for everyone involved. So the first is his front leg. So you would, your hand is the tourniquet and you just get them used to rolling off and having that tight pressure at their elbow. You can have their leg lifted, you can have their leg down, you can have them lay down and hold that leg as well. However most they like, you can practice giving light pinches up and down the leg to help pretend needle poke for them. But then that way they get used to that area of their leg being touched and you can offer treats during that way they get used to it's a good thing nothing bad is going to happen the next is their back leg okay. you will hold here for their back leg their vein will be down here but again, pressure off and just get them used to having their legs being held. We want them standing for it. So having them being used to stand or pressure under their belly so they can't sit down on you. But hold off on their leg. Give fake pitches. That way they know. And then give treats during. The last one is, and this seems, this word I want to look for, 
like a lot, but most dogs do not care about their jugular draw. So they can draw from their neck, so you have them sit. And just teach them to rest their head comfortably to where the doctor. And you can pull up their collar so their collar is higher, use juice. But you have their head. The doctor will hold. You can practice lightly squeezing or just gently pushing in on their neck so they're used to a hand in that area. And then, but we just want their head still and calm. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, sitting is best. It is hard to get the jugular draw if they're laying down on their side or laying down on their belly. And that is the three ways to draw blood on your dog at the vet. <laughs> well, that was beautiful, wasn't it? Um, you can see they've done this before. This is not Moose's first rodeo. You did see, I mean, this is real life, right? It's maybe not Moose's favorite thing to be held around the neck. You saw the tongue flicks and lip licks and, you know, a little bit of whale eye, the whites of the eyes. He doesn't love it, but, you know, he was eating some really nice snacks and, uh, you know, he knows this drill and it's not making him panic and he's just kind of enjoying the ride. So let's move on. If you want to see, um, <laughs> amateur hour, you would think, I mean, I've been a trainer for a long time. I am a huge advocate of cooperative care, but to be honest, it's not something that I have really emphasized with my own dog. I have just gone the route of bringing her favorite treats to the vet and just stuffing her face the whole time. But I am, um, I'm going to treat you to, uh, you know, my version of what Nicole and Moose just performed so beautifully. All right. So I want to show some of those procedures with a novice dog because Moose is a he's a professional and he's a trainer, but this dog is my dog. And she hasn't really done so much of this stuff, so I'm going to show you what it looks like when, with a dog who's not used to it. So the first thing I'm going to show you is this. I'm going to be using string cheese and. Give her a break. <laughs> and remember when Nicole said, you're grabbing, well, gently holding them to keep them from sitting down or lying down. <laughs> My dog knows that I can't grab her again if she lies down. So she's no dummy. So I'm just going to go right into that rolling off the vein. So I'm just holding her just a little bit. I start out simple and short because she's not used to it. So I'm gonna give her a treat every time. Try on the other side too. I'm just gonna preface this next moment by saying my dog is almost 12. And like so many of us who are getting up there in years, she's kind of set in her ways. She's a little, she's a little jaded. Um, she's a little skeptical about what I'm doing. Um, I also believe that even though she doesn't seem to understand much English, she knows something about when I am about to say something about her back leg. And she has a history of really objecting to having her nails trimmed. So I think that's what's going on when she um, does the thing that she does next. But um, she, I want you to see that she started out really cooperative because this is fun and easy, but then it sort of devolves and I'll show you what happens. She's not thrilled, but she's getting treats. So and I can squeeze and give her treats at the same time. We'll say that's good, right? She's happy and um, eager. And then I can show you um, 
Uh, let's see. We'll do a back leg, just like Nicole did. Okay. <laughs> or we won't. Okay. So I, I feel like she knew or she thought she knew what was coming next. And she thought she was going to get her claws clipped. And she said, no. And this is a good lesson though. It's a good lesson for anyone who is working with a dog who's not really used to this stuff or, you know, is still getting, is still getting comfortable with it, that the dog is allowed to say no. That's the whole, that's one of the premises of cooperative care. And that's why we do it at home we give our dogs a chance to say no so that when they really go to the vet and it's the real deal, they won't say no. They'll say yes because they know it's not, you know, it's not a big deal. But you don't want to push. You want to keep it fun and easy. All right. Next up is Nicole and Moose again. Much more, much more of a, a sight for sore eyes. All right, we are going to talk about adding some gentle control that your dog will get used to with you at home that will make them more comfortable with either the vet or technician handling them as well. Or if they stay comfortable with you holding, you can help out the vet during the appointments. So what you will want is have treats that they like and have them used to you having your arm underneath them. That way they can't sit down. You holding them underneath and they don't mind. It's just normal part of mom and dad giving pets and they don't care. And then you can also have them hold their head that way they can't turn around all the way like this. And we want to help control that. And then just like this. And then another is having your dog comfortable with grabbing their collar. It's not a bad thing. You're not dragging them anywhere. It's just another place to hold your dog and they don't mind. You can hold their collar and hold them like this and they just want treats. They don't care that you're messing with their collar or having your hand underneath them and keeping them stiff. Okay. And then next we're going to see Nicole and Moose practice some fake needle pokes. And this thing, this orange thing is a licky mat and they are wonderful because they're great. Um, they're silic made of silicone and they're a great surface with like little nubbly things and things that stick up. They're for, they're made for spreading things onto them. And then the dog, your dog would just lick, 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 lick. And the texture makes it take longer for them to finish what's on there. And for dogs, licking is really soothing. Um, it's very calming. So it's just a nice combination. Doing something that could be stressful, but you're desensitizing it. And then all the while they're licking and they're self-soothing. Right. Today, we will help your dog get used to unfamiliar pokes, as in like getting their shots at the vet. So where you're not normally going to be poking or petting them when they get their shots. You can practice at home on the couch while they're nice and relaxed laying down. You can use a pen and just their shoulder and hip points is where they would receive shots in between their shoulder blade as well. And so you can just have them used to a little bit more forceful of a touch instead of just petting them. You're grabbing a little bit of skin. And then you can take your pen, cue a word. You can say shot, poke, what have you, whatever is more comfortable for your dog to want. Take that piece of their skin and just go poke, 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 and practice pressing that pen into them. That way they get used to that 
fish. And they do not mind. And then so then when it's the doctor's turn, they are able to easily administer their vaccines without any risk on you, the vet, or your health. Okay. The next video that we're going to see Nicole and Moose starring in is about uh, desensitizing your dog to a muzzle. And I just want to put in a good word for muzzles. I love a muzzle. They have so many good uses. There has been a stigma for a long time about dogs who wear muzzles. And it's not fair because people think that only dangerous dogs wear muzzles. But the truth is, a dog wearing a muzzle is about as dangerous as a, you know, teddy bear uh, because they can't bite and they won't bite. And there are plenty of dogs who live a much better life with a muzzle um, because it's just, it takes the guesswork and the uncertainty out of you know, what might happen if they're triggered. So I know, you know, we all, we all know that your dog is the sweetest and friendliest and most perfect dog ever and would never bite anybody ever, ever, except unless maybe if they were really, really scared or something really, really hurt. So let's not take a chance. Let's just embrace the muzzle. Don't be afraid to use one. Don't be offended if your vet recommends one. There's just no shame in it. And look at these gorgeous colors. Look at this. Look at this. Look at them. It's like a fashion accessory. And here's Nicole and Moose showing you how. Because you can't just slap a muzzle on your, well, you can just slap a muzzle on your dog, but the but the preferable way is to go slow and introduce it gradually by putting lots of treats in it. So your dog just gets used to eating out of it. Um, and little by little, they just get used to the idea of wearing it. it doesn't hurt. It's not uncomfortable. It's just a new experience and they just acclimate to it. <laughs> Muzzle training and desensitization is an important factor in vet visits. And then it can be used outside of vet visits as well. If your dog is not friendly towards other dogs, if your dog is apprehensive at the vet and is more likely to show little teeth during visits, or if you're out and about on a walk and they like to eat things in the ground that they shouldn't, it gets them used to that the muzzle is just an accessory, just like their collar. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing to add stress for. And then, so it just offers a little bit of extra protection for your dog and the staff. And, like, and then you can teach your dog, it's not a bad thing to wear. It is perfectly okay. And then you can start with, first you want a muzzle that they can still open mouth pant, accept treats and take drinks in. We do not want to close off their mouth and make it hard for them to breathe. Start with, you can pour treats in okay. the muzzle, offer it to your dog. That way they get used to taking the treats while the muzzle is around their face. And then they don't care. And then pull the muzzle away, refill treats, do again. But then, and then you slowly add in the cue for muzzle. So they learn to put their head in and then slowly and surely muzzle, have it on them, and then that way they learn it is not a bad thing to wear. It's just another part of their accessories. It matches their collar and their leash, <laughs> and it's not bad, but then that way you stand. He has room to pant. He has plenty of muzzle space. And then if he did not like the doctor touching him or being near him, 
it protects him and protects the doctor and has it to where they are comfortable wearing it. They can wear it throughout the event duration and they don't care. <laughs> so, um, and like I said, I'm a huge muzzle fan. Um, I, I showed a slide two slides ago that mentions an organization that I really respect called the Muzzle Up Project. And I wanted to show you their website. Um, I should have paused on it, but anyway, their website is just muzzleupproject.com. They've done so much to destigmatize muzzles and to teach people how to desensitize their dog to wearing them. Um, I haven't used a muzzle too much with my dog. I have, um, she's seen one, but I haven't really, she's, I haven't needed one, but I really think that every dog owner should be willing to put one on their dog. So this is our first, uh, this is our first entree into the world of muzzle wearing. And I think I'm going to make an excuse for my dog again, because she does quickly, <laughs> she starts out very enthusiastic and she does quickly opt out. But part of it is just her paranoia of being followed around and videoed by my daughter, which is not normal for her. And when animals encounter something that is not normal, it could be a danger. So they tend to uh, avoid it. So without further ado. So the idea with the muzzle is you want the dog to put their own face into it. So First, we start out like this. This one's actually a little too small for her, but you can see she's all she looks at my daughter, right? She pulls her ears back, that's stress, right? She closes her mouth, that's stress, and she licks her lips, also stress. Let's watch that again. <laughs> there. So I want to, I might start out by luring up, oh, yeah. and she says no. So we're going to stop there. Yeah. Again, um, my true belief is that she is feeling weird and paranoid about being videoed, but she also didn't like what I was doing. So she left. And again, that's allowed, right? If we want our dogs to participate, we also let, have to let them decide not to. But, you know, note to self, if I want to do this again, I'm going to need spam or liverwurst or baby food or, you know, steak or mac and cheese or whatever um, my dog can't resist. And I'm going to just make it a lot shorter and a lot more fun. All right. The last thing I wanted to mention, and many of you may already know this, but Another way to uh, help your dog just get used to the idea of going to the vet is to go to the vet for a happy visit, which is just a chance to socialize, a chance to kind of mosey around in the space and get treats from everyone and say hi to all the friendly staff people, practice getting on the scale, and nothing bad happens. So it's another way that they can build a uh, positive association with a place that might otherwise make them feel a little bit anxious or a lot anxious. So this is something you can schedule. You, we're, you're asked not to just kind of walk in um, because you may have noticed another thing that is wonderful about a fear-free um, veterinary practice like Harmony is that you're not going to see dogs piling up in the waiting room. This is another, you know, this is why they ask you to call before you come in. That's not just a post, that's not just a COVID habit. That's so we don't get these um, bottlenecks where dogs are like, ah, there's another dog. Um, so you want to schedule it, but it's um, it's a really good idea to do this kind of on the regular. So your dog just gets used to the idea. Like sometimes I go to the vet and just eat and go home. And that is that. And I think um, it's it's six fifty. I think we're going to try to wrap up by seven, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to let um, 
Let me see what I need to do. If um, Nicole, if you can just unmute yourself and anybody else on the Harmony staff, if you'd like to unmute yourselves and um, and jump in to add any comments or feedback or <laughs> anything I missed or got wrong and um, be ready and to be ready to answer questions from our um, guests. No, I think that was a very beautiful presentation. Um, it's, I think the cooperative care actually started from zoos uh, because, you know, they're dealing with hyenas, tigers, bears, seals, all these very large animals that if they were angry and they did not want to do a blood draw or showed their teeth or lay still for uh, check their hearts, they wouldn't. And they could be, they're not domesticated. They're not gonna be like, oh, I'm just gonna walk away. They are large, most of the time apex predators. They will tell you no. And then so the zoo staff had learned you know, I'll work with you. We can work together. This is a good thing. This is a non-stressful thing. And then, so it's been very nice to see that kind of filter down into the horse world, the agricultural side with cows and pigs, and then filtering down into small animals for dogs and cats and things like that too. But yes, uh, Karen just hosted a great little webinar to show how to make everyone less stressed because we all know if you're going into the vets and you know your dog is a little uneasy about it, you're gonna be uneasy about it. And your unease travels down the leash and adds to their unease and just kind of escalates things. And so if you know, oh, you know, we're gonna get treats. My dog knows this. I do this all the time at home now. It's nothing new for them. Then they know, oh, it's going to be an easy visit. You're less stressed. Your dog knows what to do. Oh, yeah, I can give my arm. Oh, yeah, roll off on my leg. I don't mind. Grab blood. I'm a pro at this now. Mm -hmm. You're less stressed. The staff, I mean, we're going to try to do a blood draw. We'll work with the dog. Um, we give a couple of tries. And if the dog is like, eh, not today, then we listen to them. We go, you know what? Not today. We'll try another time. Um, but then it just makes it easier on everyone and everyone has a good time and we don't want the vet to be a scary visit. We want, we love when owners are like, oh, it's weird. They love coming here. It's like, no, 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 we want that. We want them to be happy walking in the door. Uh, we want them to be happy leaving. We want the owners to enjoy bringing their dog to the vet. It's just, just like going and getting a pup cup at Starbucks or something. We want everyone to be as stress-free and as happy as we can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey guys, can you hear me? This is Emily. Yeah. Hey, I just wanted to say this is a great um, presentation, first of all, but I just wanted to comment that, you know, it is cooperative care and we, um, I always say this in, in the exam rooms with clients, but it really does take a village and we want you to be, um, confident with uh if you if you can help in the room we don't want you stressed so it really does help us when you are um a team player for lack of a better word mm -hmm. so thank you thank you emily okay but if anyone has any questions if you don't necessarily want to speak you can type it in the chat and we can either answer in the chat or answer it through the mic if uh, anyone has any questions or if they saw something and they want a little bit extra info on um but yes uh for a quick weigh-in that's also perfectly fine most vets even if they don't practice fear free um just give them a call just make sure you know they're open or they're not having any staff events during lunchtime or anything and say hey i I'm off of work around four. Can I come around 4.30 and just get a quick wait on my dog? They can say, yeah, no problem. We'll see you then. You can come on in, jump up on the scale, see if we hopefully lost some weight or if we gained weight or if we stayed steady. 
and then um, if they want and they can accept a couple treats, but if you only need to get a quick weight, then more than welcome, come on in, jump on the scale, get a weight, we'll jot everything down and then continue about your day and go and leave. And then, um, and that's why we also implement the happy visits is to help show them every time you come into the vet, it's not being poked and prodded um, and they learn, oh, I can come in and I literally just get treats and then I leave. Oh, okay, that was great. I'll do this all the time. Um, and so that's why a couple vet practices have started implementing that. But yeah, coming in for just a wait and not necessarily a happy visit is perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. And during happy visits, we usually do try to get, uh, try to get the dog on the scale um, at least once during those visits. And we do have a lot of dogs who this minute they come into our clinic, even just for an appointment, they go straight to that scale because they're, they're like the scale means treats <laughs> and they're just so excited to be on the scale. And then if we train at home and it is a new session or if it's a new whatever that you're teaching your dog, short, simple, little lessons. Um, that way there, it's a lot of mental work for the dog as well. Even if, you know, they're not perfect at the end of it, that's perfectly fine. Short, sweet, five, maybe 10 minute sessions always ended on a good note. Um, a lot of potlucking treats and just like dumping treats on them in the first couple rounds. That way they understand, oh, this is okay. Okay. I get a lot of treats for this. Um, but that way we don't exhaust their mind and kind of wipe them out. And then they're like, oh, you know, I'm really tired doing this. This wasn't really fun. It wasn't short and simple. And that way we don't potentially make any negative associations with that but anything new just nice short simple sessions anything from anybody else just mm -hmm. throw in a couple um <laughs> a couple little tidbits um from the training uh end of things and I, this isn't a class so we can't you know we can't demonstrate this but you saw some of this um, in the videos that that um, it, it, during the presentation. One thing that's really fun is um, hand targeting or using a target stick, and that's something that you can use for all kinds of you know all kinds of purposes. You can have a dog target your hand, or target a stick, or target a spoon, or a fly swatter. All kinds of things. You can lead them around with it. You can show them where you want them to be. You can show them that they can actually fit through a space they think they can't fit through. You can show them how to walk next to you on a leash without you know, any kind of force or coercion. And if you do a lot of this at home, it's a great game to play. Targeting is really fun. Most dogs take to it naturally. And then if you bring that skill, that game to the vet, especially if it's a target stick or if it's a, you know, even if you use your hand, it's a familiar game. So it just adds to the predictability of the experience. Another thing you can do is use a mat. Uh, it can be anything, a towel, a bath mat, a rug, whatever. Um, and do all your kind of cooperative care exercises on the mat and also use the mat for just lots of relaxation so that the mat becomes associated with relaxing. Um, you can have your dog like work on a Kong on a mat or, you know, just get like massages on the mat. And over time that mat becomes like a yoga mat or a security blanket. It takes on that association of calm. Um, I taught a class, a confidence building class at, um, with Dr. Pike, who's a veterinary behaviorist. And there was a dog, a scared dog, whose people brought his mat to class. And it was amazing how he just, you know, went straight to the mat and sat down and felt great about it, so. And then yes, Tia, you can, once your dog realizes perfectly A-okay for Harmony or any vet practice, if you end up moving, um, to bring that mat 
to the practice because then they learn, oh, I relax on this mat. So then when they come to the vet and lay on the mat, then they relax at the vet. Uh, we had a client who has done a lot of extensive work with her border collie. And that's one of the things is she has a little, it's like a little bath mat. And she brings that to the appointments. And he was one where you couldn't really do a lot of work on unless he was sedated. And mom worked a lot and did a lot of the fake needle pokes at home. Um, she taught him to be comfortable with holding off her blood draws. And he came in this past week and mom held off and I gave a needle poke and we were able to draw blood without any fuss. He didn't move. And um, for him, he prefers toys to treats and that's perfectly fine. So after the blood draw, we just threw the ball around the room and he just didn't even care. He was like, oh, this was great. And so mom, we wouldn't have been able to get as far if it was just us. And so mom put a lot of work into him as well to make it a nice village that made it possible for him to be so comfortable with everything being done. But yes, mats, um, a yoga mat, you can even do a thin dog bed because the big dog beds are kind of a hassle to carry around. Um, anything that they like to lay on can bring that along to every vet visit. Any other questions? I don't want to keep everyone. Um, we're a couple minutes after seven. So if you have any remaining questions that you would like answered uh, before we wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for watching. We appreciate it. We didn't know how many interested parties we would field for our first webinar. <laughs> Yeah, we had a great audience this time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great. All right. I'm going to end it for everyone, and the recording will be available somehow, some way, um, before too long. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, Dr. Fowler, everybody. Bye.